Okay, uh, so today I'm going to con start with, uh, or maybe continue with control theory, and we'll study control theory for the next two, two and a half weeks or so. And this pretty much builds upon the uh, uh, everything we've done in transforms. So very quickly, we'll go from an overall view of what a control system is to a mathematical model. And once you have a mathematical model, then you can apply transform domain techniques to understand uh, how the system behaves and more importantly how it is to control it. But today's lecture is going to be not much math, it's going to be mostly about what is a control system and to give you sort of an intuitive understanding of, uh, of what it means to control a system and hopefully the homework on you know, controlling a car gives you some idea what it is you're going to try and study and why it's important. Okay, so Last class, I kind of talked about this notion of responsiveness and stability, the two uh, factors in the control system. Actually, there are many more other factors you need to consider in addition to responsiveness and stability, and we'll cover that a bit later. Uh, but what I'd like to do first uh, today is to talk about so the big picture of the control, uh, control system, and then what we'll do is we'll look at a few systems which all uh, be, uh, uh, fit into this overall model. And then all the examples in this chapter are based on the same uh, basic system, which is this called the web server system. And so what I'm going to do is to describe the web server system, and then we'll use that for describing the modeling approach, some mathematical models, etc. And uh, if you're going to use control theory for anything, you're going to have to essentially analyze the system, understand it very much the way I'm going to do it for the web server system. And this web server system is going to be kind of the running example, so it's important to understand what's going on. Okay, so let me start with the um, with sort of the canonical model of the control system, and I'll kind of leave it up over here, and then we'll do a few examples, including the homework examples. So the main thing we care about is the system that's being controlled, and we call that the plant. And this comes from the fact that control systems were initially um, designed for you know factories, ch uh, chemical plants, you know things like that. And so this is the plant. And we, we, the G is, the small g is the time domain description of the plant. So the plant basically has a bunch of inputs coming in and a bunch of outputs going out. And we've already seen a box diagram like this when we talked about the linear time invariant system where we used the uh, letter H to represent the transfer function uh, of, or, or a, to, of, the, of the LTI system. Here, we're going to assume that the plant is also an LTI, a linear time invariant system, and that has some inputs and some outputs, and that's, that's what the plant looks like. Uh, and f essentially, what you're trying to do is to model the plant mathematically, so we'll do that later. Okay, so the output of the plant, okay, is the Y. So remember, G is the description of the plant. Y is the output of the plant, and there's going to be some input coming in now the way the input comes in is kind of interesting. We have a, a controller, and the controller is uh, called D, and it has a control output U. But what it is, is that the input to the plant is not the control input, but actually a variation of the control input. So what we have is that you're trying to model a real world situation where the system is, is subject to some disturbance, okay? So it's like you're trying to play chess, okay? But you're very sick. So when you move the, uh, the, the, the uh, pieces, your hands are trembling and you put it in the wrong place, okay? So the trembling is, is sort of the disturbance, okay? In this, or another way, in a, in a practical situation, uh, let's say that you have a chemical process. In the chemical process, we're trying to give it a certain amount of, let's say, carbon dioxide. But the carbon dioxide uh, system, there's a hole in the, in the, in the pipe, you know, so some pipe, something is leaking out, and we don't know how much is leaking out, so that's a disturbance, okay? And we'll talk about some more things, we'll talk about the homework problem, but there's this notion of a disturbance. And so this symbol represents basically an adder, and it's adding uh, two things, the control, and then we're adding to it, the, sorry, no, that's, not a, that's not a box, it's just a disturbance. And the disturbance is affecting the control. So we think we're doing U, but actually what you're doing, what the plant is getting is U plus W. So there is this additive disturbance that be, that's being given. 
Now, the controller is being told to do something. What it's being told to do is to, uh, actually, let me start over here. What it's being told to do is to, uh, is to follow some reference input, which, which we denote as R. So, for example, you know, in the thermostat example, we want to say, OK, we want to have the reference set point temperature to be 23 degrees. That's your reference input. Now, what happens is that what the controller actually does is to compare the reference input to uh, this is going to be plus, minus, we're going to compare this to some feedback which measures what actually happened. Okay? So what, what I'm drawing over here is not any control system. I'm drawing a specific kind of control system called a feedback control system, which is the most common control system. It turns out there are other control systems called <coughs> feed forward control and cascaded control and things like that, which we'll come to later. But for now, we're going to focus on feedback control, which is the, one of the most uh, commonly used, one of the most fundamental, most, uh, you know, most uh, uh, you know, widely used things. So pretty much every control system is a feedback control system at some level. Okay? So I'll talk about that. And this is the heart of the feedback system. You'll see it in just a moment. We're going to get back. Then feedback means we're going to take the output of the plant, which is over here, and we're going to measure it. And we're going to have measurement process. And the measurement process is denoted H. And there's going to be some measurement error feeding into the measurement process, hopefully not much. And that gives you back the feedback signal, which is called B. And what we have over here is the error signal, which is going to be R minus B, OK? And this is E equals uh, R minus B. So um, right. So let me just walk through it. So we say we want the input to be R. And what the controller sees is not actually R. The controller, what the controller sees is the difference between what you want it to be and what it thinks is the actual output value, which is B. The actual output value is Y, but there's a measurement process, a measurement error. So why is the so in a moment where you'll see why it's not the same as B. Okay, the two reasons why I'll just come to that in a moment. But what the error, what the controller gets is E, the difference between what you want and what you have. And then it tries to do some action U, but its action is going to be changed. Okay, by the system, which is W. And then plant actually gets something like U plus W, and then it does what was required. And so the output may not be what you actually want. Okay. And so, so this is sort of the most uh, general form of the feedback control system. Are there any questions about this over here? Okay, okay. yeah. What's the meaning of minus sign? Minus sign is that we are going to take the reference value and compare it with the error so that the uh, controller gets what's called zero input if the error term is zero, of R minus B is zero. So if the error is zero, then we can say that the system is at the desired state. Okay, and the error is positive, we need to do something. If it's negative, it's do something else. But by definition, zero state, zero input to the controller means that everything is fine, don't do anything. Okay, rather than giving it a particular reference value, convention is that we give it the value R minus B. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions about that? Okay. So the zero state is kind of important because, as we'll see later, for us zero means equilibrium. Everything is fine. So and you know anything away from zero is bad. And for us, uh, this is important because if you remember that in an LTI system, what you're trying to do is to see that th things decay to zero. Right? You're looking at the long-term evolution. If you remember the stability criterion, we want the decay of the output to be zero. Well, what it really means is that the output is going to decay to the stable equilibrium state. So defining it to be zero is important. The way we get to zero is to have the minus over here. So it's all linked to that notion of decaying to zero. Okay? So zero doesn't mean nothing. Zero means no error. Okay, that's the important part. Okay. So uh, let me talk about the, let's, I guess we should do the homework example here because that will give a couple of examples. So when you're driving a car, there are actually three control systems at least that are, that are important, okay? So let's say you have a car that's going on this 
curved road like so, and you're, you're, you're driving over here, and there's another car ahead of you. So one of them is uh, directional control, right? You want to make sure that you're, t you're following the curve of the road. So you have to control direction. Second thing is speed. You want to make sure that you're not going too fast or too slow for that matter. And the third thing is you want to avoid collisions. It's collision control, right? So those are the three control systems that you have in a car. There are others besides, you know, but let's look at the three. So if you have the direction control, you're turning the steering wheel, it's going to, you know, make sure that you are following the track. The speed makes sure that you're not overtaking or you're not, sorry, you're not going fast in speed limit even if there are no other cars on the, on the road. And then the collision makes sure that you don't bump into anything else. And if you have these three things under control, basically a fully controlled car, okay? And uh, as you may have heard by now, we actually do have cars that are fully controlled. There are, there are cars that have been built by uh, Professor Thrun's lab in Stanford, which you can take a car, put some controllers on it, put some cameras on it, and you can drive on a freeway with no, no, uh, uh, no humans controlling it, right? It's completely controlled by machine. So uh, that actually uses a combination of control theory and statistical machine learning. But nevertheless, uh, it's not idle speculation to say that, you know, there are three controllers and this is what you do. In fact, if people believe that in 20 years from now, uh, it might be possible for you to get into the car, you know, read a newspaper while the car does all the driving. Of course, this means you have to make sure that, uh, that the lawyers are paid off because the biggest problem with this is not the, it's not the engineering, it's to make sure that if there's a problem, who's liable? You know, is Google liable? Because, you know, Google paid Stanford to do this. Is Stanford liable? Is the professor liable? Is it the grad student? Because the grad student didn't check the code properly or maybe the engine manufacturer, the car manufacturer is liable. Maybe the road builder is liable because the road was bumpy. I don't know, but uh, liability is actually the biggest issue. <laughs> okay, so let's just focus on, uh, I think for the homework I said uh, direction and collision. What is it they asked for? Let me see. Okay, so I said consider a curving section of the freeway, uh, speed limit, so we wanted speed and direction, so not collision. Okay, so let's look at these two. So these are two different controllers, right? Direction and speed are orthogonal. And so we can choose that. So let's look at the direction control. Look at the direction control. I hope nobody stole my yellow chalk. Ah, they did. Oh, well. Uh, if you look at the direction control, the, uh, the reference input, okay, is basically what is it that tells you that you're doing fine? What is it that tells you that you have the right direction, okay? On a freeway, the direction control is actually relatively straightforward. You have to be exactly halfway between these two lines, okay? Or maybe you should say you have not, you should not be too close to either one, and the, it's minimized when you're halfway through. So, for me, the answer would be the the reference input is going to be basically the center of the car versus the center of the lane, and the gap between the two, okay? So that's going to be the reference input. Okay, so you want that uh, reference input to be, you want it to be zero. So you say, okay, I want you to be at zero offset. So if this is the, to draw this uh, over here. So I have the, let's say that's the lane, okay, and this of course is your dotted line in this middle of the road, and this is your vehicle. Then you can imagine that there is this midpoint of the lane, and this is the midpoint of the car, okay? And if the car is offset, Let's say it's another car over here, which is offset like this, and that's the midpoint of the car, that's the midpoint of the lane. This distance between the two, okay, this R should be equal to zero, okay? In equilibrium, you're going to be dead center in the middle of the lane, and that's your direction that you want it to be. So that would be the, uh, for me at least, the answer of uh, reference input for the direction control. So do anybody have anything else other than this? Anybody have a different answer? Yeah. Uh, I just mentioned the angle of rotation of the steering wheel. Okay, should be. So, uh, if we have a particular reference, if we rotate more than that or less than that, that the direction is going to change. But the angle of rotation has got to be what? That is not the Well, so, so the angle of rotation of the steering wheel has, let's say this is the arc of a circle, right? Then you have to basically say that the, the, uh, 
the steering wheel is following some arc or something like that. I mean, they have to have some input. You can't just say the angle. But if, if, uh, if there is data yeah. regarding the curvature of the road, yes. we can very well define the you can. angle of the steering wheel. That's correct. That's correct. But so you have to say that the, okay, so reference input is the particular angle that you want to keep the steering wheel at. Okay, that, that's fine too. That's acceptable, I guess, because you're giving it a particular input. You want it to be that value. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah. Isn't this already an error? What is an error? The difference between uh, where the car is and the... Yes, in this case, it turns out that the reference value is zero. So the error is also going to be off of zero. But if you use his, uh, Arun's example of you wanted a particular angle theta, then it will be off of theta, which is theta is going to be the reference angle of the steering wheel, and that's okay. So then you would be not... Then in this case, it's trivial that the error is the uh, controller input. Any other... Anybody else have anything else? All of you have done this by now, so hopefully you've thought about this. So everybody got exactly this midpoint one? Well, yeah? You could say that the error should be zero, but the uh, reference input is your middle of the road. Middle of the road? So, like, uh, if you want to put error to zero, then error is sure. middle of the road minus the reference. Yeah, you could do that too. You could say that the reference input is sort of the. Uh, uh, So it's a question of what is the controller actually seeing, right? And in my case, my, I'm using, assuming that the output is going to be, uh, the, what you're going to get back actually is going to be the, uh, the position of the midpoint of the road on the roadway. That's what I'm assuming as being the output. So if you decide that the position is something else, right? So if, in Arun's case, it would be the angle of the steering wheel would be the feedback, would be the measured feedback value. Okay, anybody else have? Can we say that the input is the um, desired position and feedback is the actual position? You can say that too. Okay. Yeah, but in position, I'm betting being, being more precise about what it is. The reason I'm asking for this is because, um, as you'll see, uh, control systems are not unique. Okay? I can define the same problem. I can model it in many different ways. And some models are going to be easier than others to solve. Okay? So if you solve it and if you write it in a particular way, you'll find it easier to solve than you write a different way. And it's not unique. Right? You can, so these are all perfectly reasonable things. You know, the angular, keeping the angle is okay. Position, where you know, position is with respect to some midpoint or maybe from the sides. Okay? All of these are valid ways of, 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 of modeling the system. And again, we're going to come back to the modeling approach. But it's not a unique answer. Okay. All right. So any other questions about this? Okay. So let's look at the controller. So let's continue with my notion of having the, this R be the reference input. What the controller is going to do is, to, is the, uh, maybe you should look at the output. The output of the output Y is actually uh, not the position of the car. The output of the car, of the, uh, 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 of the system is, of course, the car itself moving on the road in some direction. Right? The output is not the control system. The control system is what's operating on the system to make it work, but the output is whatever it's doing, which is just moving along the road. Okay? And so the uh, output, in some sense of this, is the car, is the vehicle moving. And what we're doing is we're measuring the position of the car as using the measurement system, which could be some kind of uh, video camera or some kind of, uh, you could have electromagnetic strip on the middle of the road or something, uh, which tells you how far off you are, etc., uh, or radar or anything, or sonar. And so what the measurement process is doing is converting the output, which is in some physical system, into a form or, or measurement which corresponds to the input. So this is being done by the measurement process. That's why it's a process. To, to give a more, uh, exa another example, let's say I have a, a, a vessel which has got some chemical process going on and there's some pressure, okay, because of gas, okay. I want this to be at, let's say, 200 atmospheres is, the, is what I want the pressure to be. The output of the plant is whatever the gas is, right? It's gas. We have a meter that's measuring the pressure. That meter is this measurement process over here, and that gives you the feedback, which is the atmospheric pressure. But the output of the plant is not the meter reading. The output of the plant is the gas. Okay. So the meter reading is not the same as the gas. The meter reading is just one attribute of the output. Okay. And that's why the output is Y, but the feedback is B. So B is not the same as Y. B is a way to, to quantify Y. 
Okay, and in this quantification process, there could be an error. What could the error be? For example, if I'm trying to uh, navigate this road over here and it has a reference position, maybe my uh, sensor, which is supposed to be mounted in the middle of the car, was accidentally mounted two inches over. You know, it's moved to the left, to the right, or something like that. And so when it says it's in the middle, actually the measurement has a persistent error. Okay, so that's a problem, right? So, so that's an offset error, for example, in the measurement process. But at any rate, uh, this is the uh, feedback and that's the output. Okay, uh, the feedback, the error term, the error term over here is basically going to be, the uh, R is going to be, reference value is going to be zero minus B, so the error term is basically the same as the feedback, okay? It's going to be positive or negative depending on how far away we're from the midpoint. And the control input is going to be the uh, steering wheel, you know, which is going to be essentially, uh, what, what is the steering wheel action? Let's think about that for a moment. Let's say the car is over here, okay? We get a reference value, and for, let's say this is positive, this is negative, and the value is, let's say, plus five, okay? Value is plus five. So you say, okay, what is the controller? What can the controller do? The best the controller can do is to turn the wheel all the way to the right, okay? But even if it turns the wheel all the way to the right, the car is not going to shift magically like this. It's going to go, you know, it's not going to go like this, right? It's going to go like that in its, in its path, right? So the actual value, which is where you want to be, is going to be attained only after some time. Okay, it won't be instantaneous. It won't, it won't be instantaneous. It'll be, it'll go like this. And the more aggressively you turn the wheel, the sooner it gets there, but the more discomfort the passengers are going to feel, right? So if, you're a, if you've been in a car with a teenage driver, or actually <laughs> most of you are not much beyond your teens, <laughs> as I suddenly realize. For me, the teenage, <laughs> I can't, that was a while back, a long while back. Gosh, okay. So uh, a new driver, you go like this and like that. If you're a passenger in this car, it's not much fun because they don't understand uh, basic, you know, dampening, you know, which we'll talk about second order system. They want to behave like a first order system. They say, oops, I'm off to the right. Turn it all the way to the right, okay, then all the way to the left. It's like a video game, you know. Unfortunately, you're a passenger in a video game. It's not fun. So you go, boom, boom, you know, like this. You kind of get knocked about. That's a highly responsive control system, <laughs> okay, but not stable, okay? It's not stable. That's why you pay more insurance when you're a teenager. This is what's happening. So the point I want to make here, it's an important point. The first is that even though there is a controller, there is going to be this period of time when you're actually not in control, okay? Having a controller doesn't mean it's going to be perfect all the time, okay? Somehow you got drifted off over here and you're going to res respond to it, but there's going to be a period of time when you're off equilibrium. So having a controller is not guaranteeing anything. It just means that eventually you'll get there. And the time it takes, so imagine one path like this, another path like that, another path like that, you know, and so on. So these are continuum of control actions. And the faster you get to the midpoint from this point over here, the more responsive your control is and the more jerky the control is going to be. And so this, is, this visually shows you the meaning of responsiveness of the control. Okay. The, the third thing that we want to point out over here, so first is that you know, you're, it can be off, second is responsiveness. Third thing I want to point out over here is that we have to be very careful that the measurement is accurate. Let's say that the sensor is mounted on the car and let's say that this car is over here. I'll draw another car over here where the sensor is mounted a little bit to the left than it should be. So the controller is going to have the car always a little bit off to the right, no matter how good it is. No matter how good the controller is, if the measurement is an error in it, you're always going to be in trouble. Okay? And so whenever you build a feedback control system, you spend all your money into making this measurement error measurement system as accurate as you possibly can. That's why we want very, very precise sensors because no matter, you know, you can have a lot of disturbance and you can accommodate it, you can, you know, get rid of it, but if you have error here, you're in trouble. You can't do anything about it, okay? So, so we always try to make sure that we have the best possible uh, sensors that we can have to compensate for measurement errors. Okay, so I think I'll take a break, and I just, okay, maybe I shouldn't. Okay, let me do the speed one quickly because I realize okay, that's a lot easier. So input, obviously, is the reference speed. The output is the vehicle moving at some particular speed. The measurement is the velocity as measured by the speedometer. 
And the error is going to be your desired speed minus the reference uh, measurement. So it could be above or below the desired speed. And the controller is going to be essentially the accelerometer, right? The controller's accelerometer position, it says I'm going to push down or push up, uh, uh, let go of the accelerometer. And a disturbance basically means that you uh, want to go at a particular speed, but the car is going faster or slower than you want it, right? Why? It could be that you're going uphill or downhill, right? You're going steady and you're suddenly going uphill. So the accelerometer is pressing at a particular value, but you're not going fast enough. Yes, Daniel? In the case of going downhill, sometimes the RPG is very slow. Beg your pardon? For the case of going downhill. Yeah, you have to use the brake as well. Yeah, so you have two, two cases, I guess. You have the accelerometer for increasing the speed, uh, and then you can, you can decelerate. But if, 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 if you're at zero accelerometer position and still going too fast, you'll need the brake. Yeah, correct. So you'll need both. Yes? Can you consider traffic jam as a disturbance? Uh, a traffic jam, I would view it as being a, a different reference value because it's part of the collision, right? Avoidance rather than speed control. Speed control basically says I want a particular reference speed. Now you could say speed control is related to collision, right? I want to avoid a collision, and that's why I didn't give collision because they're actually coupled systems, right? We want to have two objectives at the same time. And I, I, I didn't want to get into the complications there. So uh, for now, we just say, OK, the disturbance is, uh, we have a reference value selected in some particular fashion. I don't know how, right? And then, at, and then I, 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 the disturbance is that I want to get at a particular speed, but it's not that, because I, the system is not being controlled properly, or some disturbance is entered, which is un, uh, unforeseen, unforeseen, OK? Uh, let me just finish one more thing and actually relate to what you asked just now. I could draw a line like this, a box like this, I'm sorry. And if you look at this box, it has one input, the reference input, and one output, which is Y. And in between, it's sort of doing something, right? It looks a lot like this over here. I have a controller over here, sorry, the plant over here, and they have some input and have some output, okay? And so, you could ask yourself the question, what's the difference between the smaller box, this one over here, and the larger box, okay? And the answer is, to some extent, they are actually the same, okay? We both have, we, in both cases, you have some input and some, un, some output, except over here, the plant is kind of thought of to be uncontrolled, okay? It does whatever it's doing, and it's not really controlled at all, whereas in this big box, we have inside a feedback loop which has some input and some output, uh, some output. But actually, it turns out that this whole big box can also be viewed as a control plant. Okay, it's a control plant. And this could be one box in a bigger system. Okay? And that's exactly what happens over here. So let's say that this can be viewed as a system where I give the particular velocity. And it does whatever it's doing. And the output is going to be basically the, the system controlled to that velocity. Okay? I can make this one box of a larger system which is doing collision avoidance. So there, I'm looking around, you know, I have sideways radar, front radar, whatever, and based on all this, maybe forecast of traffic conditions, it says your reference velocity should be whatever. It gives it to this system, and then this system does the velocity control, and that system is doing collision control. So we can have, uh, in this case, we would call it cascaded control, where we have a higher level objective, and we'll break it up into a lower level objective, and we'll study this in some more detail, you know, a little bit later. But ex that's exactly how these things get coupled together. And that's how we build modern control systems. We don't have one single plant. We have many, many plants, and each little plant is controlled by its own little controller, and they all kind of fit together, and hopefully, you know, they work together rather than opposing each other. So if you're jumping off from a plane and you have a control system which is a parachute, you falling to the ground is the system, is a, is a process, you're falling down. And the control system is the measurement of your velocity, which says, I'd better open the parachute a bit more. Okay, and, and so there's a very diff big difference between you and the measurement. <laughs> okay. and yes? For the disturbances for the direction of the car, yeah, many different things. You could have, for example, ice on the road, you, can, you, know, you could have bumps, you could have a you know, piece of uh, road that's not properly finished. You know, there are many, many sorts of disturbances, actually. Could be. If the curvature changes suddenly, then what happens is that it, it just change the kind of reference input. Uh, well, the 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 uh, if there's a sudden change in the 
uh, in the curvature of the road. Let's say the road, let's say, I mean, your the road curves like this, your reference input, again, it depends on how you actually define the reference input, right? If you're going to difference, at this point over here, you have a, a ch you can say my reference input change, my midpoint change, or you can say I can model it as a disturbance. It's a choice of modeling, right? I can say that I have this reference input and oops, I got this disturbance. I was going to go this way, right? The controller wanted you to go in a particular direction. The disturbance caused the plant to have a different output, okay? So I'm going to measure it and then change the controller to accommodate the disturbance. So you can view the changing curvature of the road as being a continuous distur uh, disturbance to the operation of the system. So what's the input then? The input is going to be, uh, f for the direction control, the input is going to be the uh, difference between the, uh, sorry, the reference input is going to be zero. You want to be at the midpoint. The error term tells you that I got some disturbance. See, the error term is because of the disturbance. If there's no disturbance, there's no error. Okay, L look at it this way. If everything is, is, is fine, then my, my feedback should be uh, basically saying uh, the error term should be zero, right? I'm exactly at the center point. Now the, the road curved, okay? Well, how, how is it going to be affecting the system? I'm going to see that my, 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 my directional control, the steering wheel says, okay, I'm in the middle, but I got an error term. Oops, I'm drifting off. Where did that come from? It wasn't because of me. It's because the road changed its curvature, so I got a disturbance, and that disturbance gives me an error. Say, so, okay, I'd better turn the wheel. Okay, that's why I call it a disturbance. Yes, Kevin. So in this case, changing the reference input could kind of be considered to be a disturbance. Changes in the uh, no changes in the reference input are because you change your mind about what you want to do. So you may say, I don't want to be the midpoint anymore. I want to be off to the right, for example, because I'm preparing to do some maneuver where I want to be closer to the edge, right? But the disturbance is unpredicted, uh, unpredictable or unpredicted changes to the output, right? So, so let's, let me, actually, I'm going to clarify this because it's pretty important in a modeling uh, step how you do this because you, are, you have choices, okay, how to do it. Let's take this curved road, okay, and let's say there's a, a twisted part over here and that's the midpoint. And let's say you're over here and that's sort of where you are and you're setting the velocity to go in that direction, okay? Now you get to this part over here, let us say. Oops, yeah, so let's say you get to this part over here for sake of argument, you're pretty far off, okay? So you're over here and that's there and that's the, dis that's the distance, okay? Now the controller, which is a steering wheel angle, for example, uh, is going to say go like this because that's what you want to do. But you notice that this is over here is a non-zero error. You're seeing a non-zero error. Where is that coming from? Okay, it could come from basically uh, m m multiple reasons, but certainly the change in the curvature of the road would could be viewed as a disturbance. Okay, so what you call a disturbance depends on the model. It's up to you to decide what model you want. As long as your controller is able to reachieve its control goal of zero error, despite disturbances, at some point in time, after disturbance you're going to recover from it, okay, then you're fine. Okay. Now what you want to do is that the error is bounded, right? If you, want, if you say, no, I'm going to be off the road, and only then you realize that I'm off the road, that's an unacceptable error. But if you, let's say, up to five millimeters off the middle, nobody cares, it's too small to worry. So, the, so there, the curvature of the road is an unforeseen disturbance. Now, if you change, if you choose to change your mind, you say, "No, I don't want to be in the midpoint. I'd rather be in the right edge, for the sake of argument." Then, uh, you know, I want I've, I've changed the reference input. I'm going to say, "No, I want this term to be not at the midpoint, but over here." And that's not a disturbance. That's a premeditated control action that you want to set. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. One is uncontrolled. One is controlled. And any other questions? About that? Okay, so in, in the in the, uh, in the text, I talk, go over the thermostat, which has a similar kind of uh, uh, setup, where the plant is your home and then your temperature, your measurement, feedback, etc. And the uncontrolled disturbance in the case of a home would be somebody opens the door, right? On a cold winter day, you open the door and leave it open for two minutes. The temperature is going to go much below where you want it to be, and that's a disturbance. What do you do? You turn on the furnace, you know, and eventually your temperature will stabilize. That's the a reaction to the disturbance. So the, uh, maybe I should make this point more clear. The control system uh, 
is can be viewed as being some kind of intelligence that is that is taking a, a essentially a, a potentially unstable system and adding enough smarts 